Hello everyone. In this video I would like to talk about discrete time systems due to the fact that in data-driven system identification normally we work with data which is obtained by some kind of a computer or controller. And this digital device normally is not able to process continuous quantities. So what is happening is that our real-world system like an engineering system, a biology system or whatsoever, of course this works normally in continuous time. And if we want to obtain data from the system or manipulate the system from the outside, what will normally happen is that we have some interfaces between the continuous time domain and the discrete time domain in which digital computing systems are working on. So what we therefore normally see is if we have a look at the uh, system response, so I'm just writing some arbitrary system response here, so let's say this would be a scalar response of that system, that I will use some measurement device with analog to digital conversion, which will work on a discrete time grid with the time difference between two time step Ts or delta T. And from this viewpoint of this computer, of this controller, which will have access to this measurement device, we will only see the measurement points at these distinct time steps. So for example, from the viewpoint of the computer, the actual signal would maybe look something like this, right? So we do not know what is happening in betwe between here, so we would not have access to this greenish curve, but we would only have access to the measurements at these measurement points, uh, discrete measurement points with distance delta t. Also, if I want to manipulate this system, so if I have some actor which can manipulate that system from outside, normally this computer or controller has also only the opportunity to change its input to the system, so its output, which is the input to the system, on this delta t time grid. So that means also that this signal u of k at the time steps k will be only um, changing at this discrete time steps and here we consider zero order hold so that basically means that also just at these time steps we will have a potential change of the input quantities so something like this for example right so this would be here our u of k, here this would be our y of k, and this notation k basically means that this is our cased time step. So this here could for example be k equal 1, this could be k equal 2, and so on because we assume here an equidistant time grid, so that basically means we can just numerate these different time points in an ascending order, and this is represented by this bracket notation u square bracket k, basically meaning, okay, this is a discrete time signal, which is defined on a discrete time grid. In this discrete time world, we also need to rewrite and revise our model equations a little bit. First I start with uh, the general state space model and the nonlinear case, which becomes xk plus 1 is identical to f xk and uk and y of k becomes g of xk and uk. So this basically is not a differential equation anymore, but we call this a difference equation because we have a time information here, a temporal information on a difference time basis from the time step k towards the time step k plus one. Therefore formally this f 
is also not the same f as in the continuous time case, like this f here, but formally it would be something like an f d and d for discrete time, because this f d will be not identical to this f, because this is representing the continuous time dynamics and not the discrete time dynamics. How can we get um, f d, for example, uh, we have already learned that, so one potential way to get fd in the nonlinear case would be approximately, for example, using the uh, explicit Euler approach, which we have already learned about, and this would be xk plus 1 plus delta t times our f of xk and uk. And this f here, of course, would be again now our continuous time f, right? So this would be one uh, opportunity to get uh, f of d in an approximate fashion out of the continuous time model. There are also other approaches, but we will not go here into details. On the other side, this matrix, or this not matrix, but this function g, which is representing the output equation, this is actually the same equation as of the continuous time model, because in the continuous time model, this is an algebraic equation, just a static equation, so it does not depend on time. So this g here is actually the same g as here. Okay. In the linear case, so this was nonlinear, but we of course can also simplify this to the linear case. It looks similar, but different. So it becomes xk plus 1 is equal to a times nope, times x of k plus b times u of k, and the output would be y of k is c times x of k plus d times u of k. And here again, we need to differentiate between the state dynamics and the output equation, because the state dynamics, if we compare it with our continuous times model, this is not the A and B from the continuous time domain, but this is actually an A, D, and B, D, so a discretized version out of it, which we can generate from the uh, continuous time domain. This is again then becoming a difference equation, so which basically tells us an explicit uh, calculation rule to get from xk to works xk plus 1 using the knowledge of u of k. How can we get a, d, and b, d? It's actually quite simple in the linear case. Here in the uh, discrete time case, in the nonlinear case, we could just approximate it, but actually in the linear case, we can actually calculate that because we know uh, that um, actually our uh, system response here for this, um, for this, um, continuous time case was basically something like uh, in x of t is equal a times t times x zero. And from this we can basically find that a d is identical to e a times delta t, right? Because we're just evaluating that for the time steps delta t. So we can get here an exact solution. The same can be done also for BD when we compare this equation to our continuous time solution and BD becomes the integral from zero to delta t of e to the power of a um, of delta t minus tau b d tau. So in this case, we can actually calculate AD and BD in an exact way and find direct solutions between AD, BD and A and B from the continuous time domain. So what is the interesting point of that is that if I'm having access to this discrete time state space representation, I can utilize them also, of course, for simulation purpose, but I can also utilize them in order, for example, to manipulate the data, to derive controllers, or trying to utilize not the continuous time models, but directly the discrete time models for 
state space estimation or for parameter identification. The important part here is also just to motivate that from a computer point of view, from a controller point of view, which works as a digital device, that um, information regarding inputs, outputs, and then eventually also state are normally not continuous quantities because we are just having access to these information on discrete time intervals. Thank you for listening and see you soon.